Now, if you're starting to get the shanks of the notion that the story of Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect series is over, do not fret. We have your methadone today. The voice of Vorcha number two is here. Mark Mir. Thanks, Mark, for joining the show. Not at all. Thank you for having me. Now, how do gamers really know you beyond uh, your amazing work as the Vorcha in the series? Uh, well, in addition to uh, my much lauded work as a Vorcha, <laughs> I also do I do a little work uh, playing the player character, or the male version thereof, anyway. Commander Shepard. I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite store on the Citadel. Absolutely. Now, how does it feel now that uh, Commander Shepard is either dead, Reaper God, burnt up, and his story is done? How does that feel for you? Well, I think Reaper God is the best of those options. <laughs> All right, yeah, so that's, uh, I guess, the Ben's answer for you, then. Yeah, yeah, also, I get to voice that uh, particular ending, so that's why I like that one. Absolutely. And well, in terms of the overall experience uh, as an actor, looking back on it, how does, uh, how does that feel? Uh, pretty amazing. You know, it is uh, a real honor to be part of something like Mass Effect, because I'm essentially uh, a geek myself, so getting to be in something that, uh, that other folks have compared to, uh, favorably compared to Star Wars uh, is uh, pretty great. And, uh, you know, I'm the sort of fellow who would have paid to go to conventions, so getting to go to them as a guest is uh, really just the icing on the cake. There you go. Now, you're also continuing the tradition of unflinchingly funny Canucks. Who are some other Canadians that perhaps uh, inspired you to your current career? Oh, well, thank you very much for that. And uh, well, definitely I have uh, quite a few Canadian role models uh, in terms of comedy. Uh, certainly John Candy, uh, Joe Flaherty. Uh, the, the entire cast of SCTV, mm-hmm. actually, uh, that was uh, that was a real uh, influential part of my uh, my upbringing. Uh, Kids in the Hall, of course, uh, a little later once it was in high school, and uh, yeah, I mean Canada has such a rich comedic history and uh, and fantastic improv as well. So, uh, which I continue to do to this day. That's uh, that's actually kind of my focus is improvisational theater. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a good to be a, good to be a Canadian when you are in that business. How has uh, your skills and training in that great Canadian style, I'm going to say that, uh, brand improv uh, helped you in your work in the Mass Effect series? Well, I'd say the lessons that improv teaches can be applied to nearly any branch of acting, but particularly uh, with voice acting. Just the fact that a lot of the time, especially with video game voice acting, you're uh, doing a cold read, like you haven't seen the script uh, before you've walked into the booth. And uh, they do this for various reasons, for secrecy and uh, and also just uh, in terms of the amount of writing that has to be done in the game. They really can't give it to you ahead of time and certainly not all in chronological order. So being able to just jump into character, uh, jump into a situation and uh, and go from zero to 60 really comes in handy. And improv does teach you that. How has your uh, typical day in the booth really changed since the first Mass Effect game to recording the final DLC of the game? Because it is a fair, largely span of time, and you've obviously spent a lot of time voicing Shepard. Has the technology changed, and has your approach, I guess, to Commander Shepard adapted in that time? Uh, Well, in terms of technology, yeah. I mean, in the early days, we did kill a lot of trees. Uh, There were a (laughs) lot of scripts that went through. And uh, we, of course, moved on to uh, just reading from a screen and uh, using a system called VEDA, which actually also, I think, helped the performance. Uh, With VEDA, you essentially have the other actors' performances uh, in your headset as you're acting. So you're not acting into a vacuum. You're actually, say, you're doing a scene with Keith David, then you've got Keith David's performance in your headset. And uh, and so it's a little more organic in that sense. Uh, beyond that, uh, well, I would say that you know the character of Shepard uh, underwent some changes as well, like, especially near the end in the third game. They were a lot more willing uh, to let uh, myself and, and Jennifer uh, Hale, who does the female version, express a bit more emotion and show the toll that... Uh, mm-hmm. But what essentially is years of war uh, we're having on the character. Uh, when we first started out, of course, they wanted to keep Shepard sort of a, a blank slate, as it were, like uh, because Shepard is unique, and it was a challenge that both Jennifer and I faced, in that it's a character who, whose personality, whose background, nearly everything about them is determined by the player. So there is no one canon Commander Shepard. Everybody's Shepard is equally as valid, and they're all going to be different. So, uh, so yeah, it was uh, it was interesting to uh, to try to find the core of what's the same, whether you're Paragon or Renegade, male, female, whatever race. What is the core of Commander Shepard uh, that that doesn't change, uh, no matter how much their background or personality might. And what we settled on was the fact that Shepard was a military officer who's used to giving orders under fire and uh, and doesn't necessarily fold under pressure. Uh, but again, as I say, as we got near the end of the third game, they allowed that shell to crack a little bit and you mm-hmm. see a little more of the human side of Shepard and the, the real toll that 
everything was taking on them. This bond that ties us together is something the Reapers will never understand. It's more powerful than any weapon. Stronger than any ship. It can't be taken or destroyed. Now that you have um, essentially that core that the folks at Bioware and you were able to really decide of what represents Shepard, regardless of the nuances, what are some of the difficulties of making sure that you go from a renegade sort of Shepard to a Paragon one? What, do, what is your process? And um, in terms of the actual response, do, would you do a, a sections perhaps where you're responding very much in you know the renegade pathway for a dialogue scene and then you switch it up to Paragon or do you have to go back and forth for every line that's being thrown at you? No, generally we do uh, a par- you know the pass of the Paragon yeah. pathway dialogue, mm-hmm. and then then Renegade or or vice versa, depending on on how we recorded it. Uh, there were some lines, of course, that had to be shared between both Paragon and Renegade, uh, and so that was another challenge, of course, is like trying to ride that line so that you don't seem you know bipolar in your yeah. reactions. Like mm-hmm. it, not everyone plays a pure Pen- Paragon or a pure Renegade, so to find that line where you're not you know, wildly swinging forth in your emotions. And uh, and then, of course, there are neutral lines that are going to be used for both Paragon and Renegade. So, yeah, you know, you can't put too much pepper on it, as it were. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, so, of course, we, we relied on our uh, directors, uh, Caroline Livingstone and uh, Suzanne Hunka, uh, later in the third game. Uh, they were the ladies that I worked with most. And uh, they, they were the ones that kept us on track. Also, you know, let us know when in the game this is happening. Give us some context for the scene. Because, again, we were not doing it in chronological order necessarily. Absolutely. Now, in terms of your actual sound and performance, what are some of the audible and perhaps nuances that uh, a Paragon Shep would have that uh, a, renegade, a renegade, excuse me, a Shepherd wouldn't? Uh, well, I'd say that I mean they are essentially supposed to be the same person, mm-hmm. and again, yeah. like you're, so you're 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 the same person, and regardless of whether you're Paragon or Renegade, ultimately Commander Shepard is saving the galaxy one way or another, uh, and it just depends on what sort of tactics he or she is using. So he could be anything from a completely selfless hero to an utterly utterly ruthless bastard, <laughs> and uh, so I'm not sure if there were there were specific vocal tics or, or uh, characterizations that we would use to differentiate between the two of them. It was more uh, just what you were willing to do to get the job done. Perhaps then just a more general assessment of just Shepard himself. What are the differences that you made um, in terms of your sound to get that Shepard sound beyond, obviously, your uh, your normal cadence and your normal uh, timbre? Well, it's it's essentially just me trying to sound tough. I think <laughs> really that's that's all it would take, and yeah, then yeah, you found that that's that, that was uh, the sweet well, spot. Well, and and of course dropping it, you know, doing all our actory things and dropping in the the military discipline and that sort of thing, uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, essentially you know trying to act like you're someone who is used to having uh, a crew's life in their hands and uh, and is comfortable making decisions that could affect those lives. Do you happen to remember the first line you recorded uh, for this series, and do you know if it ended up in the game? I, you know, I can't actually recall what the very first line, yeah. because I, I did, you know, there was demo stuff initially and things like that. I do remember some of the very earliest, uh, the, the E3 demo. That, oh, uh, really? Okay. That was, uh, you know, this, so I'm not sure how much of the stuff that we actually recorded ended up in the game. Some of it, some of it got re-recorded, some of it might have been reused. But uh, the very first sort of thing that I was doing for the game was uh, Commander Shepard threatening a Salarian bartender, who I was also playing. Uh, so it was me threatening myself uh, to give me information. A billion lives are hanging in the balance here. I won't let some piss ant bartender slow me down. Wait, uh, hold on. I, I just remembered. She's in the casino upstairs. You, you can't miss her. And that then started the uh, this amazing space opera that we know today. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, there are there are a few uh, points in the game where I end up arguing with myself, or threatening myself, or killing myself. What are uh, some other instances of that? Yeah. That uh, well, I'm uh, I'm of course all the Vorcha, as you yeah. mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. So anytime you run into a Vorcha, it's me. And you know, the Vorcha usually don't come out well in their interactions with Shepard. Uh, then there's uh, Niftukal, the biotic god Volus. Uh, you might remember he's a Volus that's kind of dosed up on uh, red sand, I think, and he thinks he has biotic powers. He does not. Uh, although later he proved so popular, they, of course, when they came out with a Volus in multiplayer, he did end up being a biotic god, or he has the potential to be. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so I voice him, I voice, uh, as I said, the, the multiplayer Bor- uh, Vorcha, all of the Hanar. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's entire ra- alien races that I am all of. Uh, including Blasto, of course, who, mm-hmm. who was a lot of fun to do. 
And uh, uh, spoilers, uh, if you play the Citadel DLC, of course, there's that great scene where, where Blasto and Shepard actually finally meet. This one is the hero of the Citadel. This one has an incendiary projectile with the counselor's name on it. Fortress. Uh, this one is the hero of the Citadel. I'll handle it. This one insists. This one doesn't care. This one wishes he was still frozen in the refrigerator. It is one of the more iconic scenes of the series. Absolutely fun, amazing. Man. So you do get thrown beyond the uh, the fact that you're doing Commander Shepard. You get to be all of the really funny and memorable races that perhaps a lot of players didn't know that you're the voice behind it. Oh, well, you know, technically, hopefully they didn't know until I tell them. Because, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, that would, <laughs> that would uh, and well. uh, yeah, of course, my background is comedy. So like getting to do parts like Blasso and Niftu Cal and, you know, even the Vorcha to an extent. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. And the Vorcha do have some comedy moments. Absolutely. Now, the amongst I, their gnashing of teeth and whatnot. <laughs> the idea of uh, camaraderie and the Normandy really being a family uh, shines through in the series. Have you had the chance to meet all these squad mates that you've been talking back and forth with, and even developed in terms of uh, gameplay these romances with for three games? Have you had the chance to meet them, or is this bond built just through hearing the lines played back uh, with the system you guys got? Uh, we, during recording, most of us did not meet. Uh, I got to meet Jennifer Hale uh, shortly before the third game came out, but uh, we'd, we'd done the bulk of our recording for the series at that point. So mostly I meet these folks at conventions afterwards, and I haven't met all of them in public like, or in person. Uh, some of us have uh, done sort of uh, Skype interviews together and, and chatted over Twitter, that sort of thing. But uh, uh, I'd say, yeah, there's... There's more people I haven't met than I have. So I've met Jennifer Hale. Uh, she's great. She's fantastic. It's a real honor, actually, to get to uh, play the other half of her. Cause she's like one of the most prolific voice artists in North America. And I was a fan of hers uh, even before we got the gig because uh, I, I like a lot of uh, DC animation, and she does quite a bit of work in that. Uh, so let's see. Who else have I actually met? Um, Raphael Sparge I just met at Dragon Con last year. And I had to admit to him while sitting next to him on a panel that I had killed Caden on both of my places. <laughs> uh, so, I, <laughs> so I've only seen Caden in Mass Effect 1 from my, as a player. Okay? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, and let's see, uh, Courtney Taylor, who plays Jack. Uh, and uh, I did have the great pleasure uh, of meeting uh, Lance Henriksen. And uh, I got to see meet Martin Sheen while he was recording. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, he was great. It was mm-hmm. a very, very nice guy. Uh, Seth Green I met, although, uh, funnily enough, it wasn't in connection to the game at all. It was just, uh, I met him socially uh, through a mutual friend of ours, uh, Nathan Fillion. Nathan had invited both of us out. And uh, so I, of course, was able to go, well, Mr. Green, we've actually worked together before. <laughs> so it's nice to have those ends. And I am occasionally at cons able to go up to, to other guests and say, yeah, no, we've actually worked together. Uh, Martina Sirtis, I, I met her that way. Uh, she actually told me a funny story that shortly after Mass Effect came out, someone brought a copy of it uh, to her to sign at a convention. And uh, she, you know, she'd probably done all of her recording within a session or two, you know, months before. And so she kind of forgot that she'd been in it. And she was like, no, 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 I'm not in that. And, <laughs> and then wouldn't sign this thing because she was insisting she wasn't in it. And then later recalled, oh, wait, I am in that. I should have signed that. Actually refusing to, uh, to yeah. sign the thing with the fact. Well, yeah, look, I'm not in this, okay? Yeah. <laughs> How was that experience of meeting these actors who you've been essentially working with based on the technology you have? It's it's presented in a way so you, you're getting the playback and you're feeding off, you know, their emotional responses. How was it to actually meet them, especially um, some of the actors who um, in the game you developed romances that last three separate games? What is that experience like? It's uh, it's interesting. And I, actually, the first time that I met uh, Lance Henriksen uh, at Dragon Con, he actually, uh, we, we chatted about that. He was telling me about when he was working on the uh, the Tarzan cartoon for Disney. And of course, he was uh, sort of the surrogate ape parent to Tarzan, and uh, Glenn Close was his ape wife. And uh, so, of course, they were they were playing married gorillas. Uh, but uh, they never met. They, they'd they never been in the same room together. And so, yeah, it's, voice acting, it's a, it's a unique thing. I mean, I know often in animation, they, they try to do it Simpsons style and get people together. But especially in video games, and given the fact uh, of, you know, just the, the fact of scheduling and that we have cast members in, you know, uh, in Canada and the U.S., in England, uh, it was it was just impossible to get everyone together for that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a 
it's a unique experience. Because uh, again, there are, there are some co-stars of mine whose work I've greatly admired, and who was a real thrill for me to get to work with them. But uh, I, I still have not met them in person, like Keith David, for example, and and uh, other folks. So slowly but surely, as I attend more and more conventions, I'm hoping our paths will cross. Well, you, speaking to that a little bit, you're one of the rare voice actors who really thrives and participates more actively, I'd say, in the fandom of the character you play. The uh, the YouTube video of you voicing the famous "Will Bang Okay" from oh, okay. The, yeah, <laughs> it's it's you really don't expect a voice actors to take that route, and I guess yeah, why uh why did you do that, and why do you like to keep doing that sort of thing? We'll bang okay, we'll bang okay, we'll bang okay, we'll bang okay. Well, that one in particular I did just because I'm a big fan of gamer poop. Like, yeah. it's, it's very funny. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I remember how excited I was when they when they did a Mass Effect one, and then they did you know more. Uh, yeah, I love those. I love those videos. They they crack me up. Uh, so yeah, I'm just as honored that Gamer Poop <laughs> chose to do a, a YouTube video about our game. Uh, so yeah, of, I, of course I would do that, and also, also uh, I don't think Bioware would get mad at me for doing that. Yeah, it doesn't seem they, like something. Because they uh, quite like their fans, and they support their fans, and uh, you know they usually have a presence at cons, and they they love you know the cosplay and things like that, and and of course that led to me uh, uh, getting a suit of armor made for me, a Ven Seven armor. Yes. Uh, a fellow named David Carpenter of Evil FX Props, uh, who I'd met at Dragon Con a few years prior. Uh, he'd been dressed as Shepard, and so I'd introduced myself. I was dressed as a Hunter S. Thompson version of Sinestro at that point. Uh, and uh, so we'd become friends. And then he, uh, a few months prior to last Dragon Con, uh, just got a hold of me and said, I will build you a set of N7 armor for free. And what response could I have? But I will wear it. <laughs> and that was great. We had a great time doing the parade and whatnot, uh, hoping to go back again this year. So yeah, but just to have that experience as fans, to see that, oh, wait, Commander Shepard is aware that there are other, you know, the culture that's surrounding him is making these uh, these parodies about him, and he's a part of it. I think it's an amazing experience for the fans. What has been, in your experience, when they see you at these events, just participating like them, what has been, I guess, the interactions with fans when they do spot you like that? Well, I guess, uh, you know, I, it's... It, from my point of view, I'm just as thrilled, right? Like the, yeah, one, yeah. Of, one of my most thrilling moments was at a con and seeing someone walk past dressed as Commander Shepard uh, or, you know, picking up, you know, the action figure of my character. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, it, it helps because I was already a geek when I got this gig. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that would interest me even if I wasn't in the game. So, uh, so it's, yeah, it's certainly no hardship for me to participate in the fandom. Uh, I'm only too happy to. Absolutely. And again, we're talking to you, Mark Mir, the voice of Commander Shepard, VGS Talk Radio, AM 640. I've always wondered, since your voice is really needed for pretty much any content that's being developed for the game, when it comes to recording the DLC, especially the uh, the final DLC, the very dialogue-heavy Citadel DLC, was that something that you worked on progressively through the, the development of the original game, or was it really like essentially what the DLC was, a kind of a cathartic experience where people are coming back to uh, give their kind of final goodbye to the series? Oh, yeah, the, it was definitely the last thing we worked on. Like yeah. uh, the DLC packs are generally, you know, they, first we work on the main game, and then we work on, uh, you know, at, subsequent to that we come back for, for the various DLC packs. It's not like everything's being worked on at once and they're sort of letting releasing it in dribs and drabs. It's like... You know, a DLC pack is not yep. out yet because they haven't made it yet. Absolutely, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, with it, that that was nice actually because Citadel was the sort of big goodbye, filled with so much fan service and so many in jokes and so many great little character bits. And it was the very last thing that we did, and so it was a great way to actually say goodbye to the series for everybody. You know, everyone who worked on it. Uh, I was actually. I think I was at uh, Momocon in Atlanta, uh, and Chris Priestley from Bioware was there as well. And that was the weekend where they were having like the final, final Mass Effect meeting, like after the release of Citadel. And as uh, Chris put it, uh, you know, he was of course uh, texting to the folks back home. Uh, he said there were many manly tears shed, <laughs> uh, and I think that goes for everybody. It was just a you know great series to work on, and uh, and I think Citadel, as I say, was a fitting goodbye. What made it a great series to work on? Just the amount that fans invested in mm-hmm. the character. You know, people really cared about these characters. There was such an emotional attachment to them. And, you know, in, in terms of science fiction, it's a fairly young franchise, right? It's not not something that's been around that was, a, you know, a movie in the 70s and people have loved it for their entire lives. It, it sort of appeared fully formed and was just embraced. The, the, the other thing is that such a rich 
fictional universe had been created. You know, there was so much thought went into the background of everything, and that made it easy, I think, for fans to buy in because it was like, look at this universe that's been created for us to, you know, let our imaginations loose in. Absolutely. Now back to the Citadel DLC. Just a really, like you said, an incredible experience. A real. A real DLC that is uh, fan service. It lets you have all those great in-jokes that you've been working on for so long and to get those cathartic experiences with these characters that perhaps would never have normally in the game see each other. Um, Coming to work thinking that this is the last time you're going to do this, the last time you're going to be voicing Commander Shepard in the way we know him now, what was that process like? You talked about a little bit there of some manly tears, but was it was it kind of known that this was this was the end? And what does that uh, what does that mean when you're coming to work to voice your very last lines as Commander Shepard? Yeah, of course. You know, it does have some weight because this is uh, a game that's been very good to me, and uh, you know, we've been working on the series for a number of years. And uh, I, I guess we, you know, the the fact that there was that kind of feeling around the, the main game as well. That kind of helped because you were sort of eased into letting go of it for over the course of a year. Mm-hmm. Because the same sort of questions came up when we were releasing uh, Mass Effect 3. And of course it was just like, well, there's going to be lots of DLC, so this isn't the last thing, so of course I'll be playing Commander Shepard again. And, and so, like, with each DLC pack that came out, we knew, of course, it was like, ah, there's one less, ah, there's one less, you know. So it's sort of like being, you know, David Tennant and realizing that, well, the, <laughs> yeah. the 11th Doctor is going to be showing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so yeah, it was uh, it was a chance to like sort of slowly let go and say goodbye. But definitely, it was it was somewhat emotional on the the final day of Citadel DLC, and they had uh, some uh, some folks from Bioware filming that. Actually, I think they uh, they filmed me stepping out of the booth and saying goodbye to Commander Shepard, uh, and I think that was used in a sort of retrospective video somewhere on YouTube. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, you've spoken uh, publicly before about the ending of uh, Mass Effect 3 and, of course, the, the fan response to that. Now that it's all over, now that we have the um, Citadel DLC and the Extended Cut DLC, what is your position? How do you feel about it? And, uh, yeah, what's uh, what's your assessment now that essentially it's uh, it's all over? Well, as I've said before, you know, I didn't actually, I didn't take issue with the ending. Certainly, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's probably not my place to do so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, hey, Bioware, I think it should end this way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, so because I'm an, I'm an actor working for them, and, of course, uh, it's kind of my job to serve the vision of the writers, you know, and, and tell the story that they wanted to tell. So I, I didn't take issue with it. Uh, and for the most part, it seemed like what fans wanted most, there were, there were things that were not made clear. Like, Bioware did... I think initially want to leave it kind of open-ended and like spark discussion and you know of course the, the, that whole thing with the indoctrination theory that came up because like when that came out I was you know I, as much as anyone I was like oh, this, this actually seems plausible could this yeah, actually yeah. be real <laughs> and uh, so I think that a lot of the issues were addressed with the uh, extended cut the uh, just the clarifications of like oh you know are the Mass Effect relays destroyed no they're not actually destroyed they're damaged they can be rebuilt so you know we haven't trashed this universe that you guys love so much beyond all repair. Uh, but at the same time, you know, even because I, I was following the discussion and things like mm-hmm. that, and, you know, I would like issues like, well, then that means that the Armada is trapped on Earth, and, you know, some of them are going to starve to death because they can't eat the food that's there, and, you know, depending on their species. And, you know, again, I was just thinking, like, wow, that would be a very interesting jumping off point for a game, like this stranded alien Armada, and, like, a lot of them only have weeks to live because they've. You know, they, they can't digest the proteins in our The food. fan fiction, the the um, the odes and funerals to Garrus and Tally because yeah. they're on a place that they can't live. <laughs> Immediately, the first week it was out, you're just looking on the forums, you see, why are people writing these um, swan songs for these great characters who didn't die? And you find out it's just in response to that. But yeah, continue, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, no, but I mean, again, that could be a very interesting mm-hmm, thing. Yeah. You know, so you begin a game where it's like, all right, we've... Uh, my species can't survive on this planet for more than a, a week or, or a few days, so we've got to get off of here and go from there. But again, I, uh, I think that a lot of the the questions and uh, and issues people had were addressed in the uh, in the extended cut. And as I mentioned, the, the Reaper God uh, ending <laughs> I particularly enjoyed. Because you got to be the Reaper God. Because and you got to become a Reaper God. Yes, and indeed. of course, you know, depending on whether you're a renegade or a paragon, uh, it could seem more or less ominous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. 
Um, in terms of Citadel DLC, in relation to that, because just kind of in response to what we were saying before, the fans that did take issues because they wanted that catharsis, um, do you think Citadel DLC kind of, if they got the answers, the information they wanted from Extended Cut, and perhaps Citadel gave them the soul and, you know, that, that yeah, beautiful the, gooey story, do you think do you think it achieved that? the chance or? to say goodbye is what yeah. people were looking for. And, you know, no, uh, I'm afraid there wasn't a DLC pack that let you have... Uh, the, the the famous saying, you know, have blue babies and retire <laughs> on a beach. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that it really it it satisfied that emotional need to say goodbye to all the characters and and, and like when you take that and the extended cut, it's like yeah, so such a perfect ending. Yeah, yeah, it really really does give you that wonderful little check mark at the end. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We're a big fan, and we do appreciate you uh, joining our show here. Any final words to the fans who have been playing? through your voice, playing as you, essentially, for uh, for several years. Thanks for being Commander Shepard. I should go. <laughs> there we go. We got our promo again. That is a uh, big thanks to Mark Mirror, the voice of Commander Shepard, Andy Burkemski, VGS. Ah, you've had a good ride. <laughs> the best.